Uh, morning, everyone. I see we're a little bit less than normal. Is it the weather or Project 2, you think? <laughs> Maybe? I don't know. Any questions before we get started today? Yeah. So when did we get homework 3 or 2? You want homework 3? Or is it homework 2 or 3? Uh, homework 2. We only don't want homework. <coughs> It's going to cover stuff we're going to talk about today, so I'll probably release it tonight. It depends, all depends on what stuff we get through, right? I don't want to give you a homework assignment before we've actually covered enough material. So uh, just to kind of clarify, the syllabus is a plan of how we want the semester to go, but that doesn't say it's going to definitely go like that, right? Especially with the homework assignments. Uh, the projects will be pretty, very similar on the due dates. Yeah? When is the project? Uh, the next project is due, what is it, March 4th? It's a lot more difficult than what you've done so far, so you have a lot more time on it. Um, so yes, so there will probably be two homeworks in between that, I think. Yeah. When's the first midterm? When's the first midterm? The midterms are set, they're on the syllabus. Next Friday? Cool, next Friday then. All right. Any other questions? stuff, project stuff. All right, let me get cranking. Okay. So let's kind of look at this example. So we're going to go back to first sets. So somebody, just, somebody remind us, what are first sets again? So let's, uh, let's, let's start at the, at the top. What are the inputs to our first function? C of G. What was it? C of G. Context free grammar? Context free grammar, not quite. Not the whole grammar. No. Although, you can kind of think about maybe the start represents the context free grammar, but part of it. But we don't have to pass an entire context free grammar there. What was it? Non-terminals are part of it. Yeah, that's one of the inputs. Can we also pass a terminal into the first function? Yeah, right. So it would tell us that, hey, yes, uh, we can do that. We can also pass a sequence. So that's the other important thing. So, um, ah, sorry. Right, so this is kind of how we're defining um, first sets. So we're defining first sets as they can take in a sequence of what we're going to call grammar symbols. So uh, where grammar symbols are non-terminals, terminals, and epsilon, right? Everything we use in the grammar, except obviously an arrow, right? That doesn't make sense. Uh, that's just a little syntax rule. So, it, so this is the input. So what does a sequence mean? What is it? Yeah, it could be in any order. And the order matters, right? In a sequence, the order matters. Uh, just like the rules in our context-free grammar, right, are in the left-hand side is a non-terminal, and on the right-hand side, and then a production rule, and on the right-hand side is a sequence of these symbols, right, terminals, non-terminals, and epsilons. What's the output? What do we want? What do we want this function to return? Yeah. The set of possible first characters from the grammar uh, the set of possible first characters, uh, yeah, definitely. What's the type, though? What's the, like, if you think about this as types, right? The input types are? Oh, tokens. To yeah, set of tokens, right? Set or a set of terminals, set right? Of Thinking about it in the grammar. Set of terminals, a set of tokens, right? So, yeah, so that's what we want to think of this as. The first set returns a set of terminals and also epsilon, right? We've seen that we want epsilon to be in the first set. Uh, and then the semantics are, we want this function to return the set of all terminals and epsilon that begin strings derived from alpha, right? From this sequence of terminals, non-terminals, and epsilons. So starting there, right? So if we have this grammar, so what, 
what is the language? Let's practice more context-free grammar stuff. So what's the, if you describe this uh, this grammar in English, the language described by this grammar, what would it be? You want to read your hand? Single A, any number of B's, any number of uh, C's, right? Or the empty string. <coughs> so if we just calculate and wanted to calculate the first of S, can we do it just by looking at that top rule? No. No. Why not? Because there's no terminals. It could be A, B, or C. Right. So we kind of can think of, OK, in this case, right, because we have S goes to A, uh, the non-terminal A, S goes to the non-terminal B, S goes to the non-terminal C. Well, I really need to define those first sets, and then I can use those to build the first set of A, right? So what would be the first set of A, then? And what do you look at to do this? So now we're going to try to think about, we want to build up some intuition here, but we want to think about how would you actually compute this? Like, what would you, how would you write an algorithm to do this? So what's the first set of A from looking at these rules? A big A. You go to look at what A represents. Uh, you look at what A represents. So yes. which of these three rules, one, two, three, four, are you going to look at? Uh, what? You look at all of them, but you pick one. You look at all of them? We're trying to find the first set of big A. Oh, I guess it would just be A, little A. Right, so it would be little A, and you look at this rule. Why look at this rule? It's, it defines A. It defines big A, right? So this. This rule says, hey, this defines that strings that are derived from A in our tree, that have A as their root, they're all going to start with this rule. Um, so we know from looking at that, hey, all those strings are just little a, right? So they have to be little a. What about for B? So which, which rule do I look at? One, two, or three here? Three. Three? Two. Two? Two. One, two, three? I want to calculate first of big B. So why do I look at three? I look at three, and then what do I do? Somebody help me out. You look at yeah, in the back. So the starting non-terminal character for B is or for uppercase B is going to be a lowercase B. Um, How do you know that? From looking at those two rules? Yeah, from looking at the rule for B. Right. So looking at the rule for B, you can say, OK, uh, I know it has to all strings, all possible strings that B can generate, right? They have to start with a B, a single B character. So I know the first set of B. Uh, what about for C? What do I do for C? Either nothing or C. It's either nothing or C, or instead of nothing, right? We want to say epsilon, so we're very clear, right? Um, so the epsilon is very is pretty clear, right? We have a, a specific rule C goes to epsilon, right? But how do we get the little C from these rules? Because if we look at this rule, big C goes to big C, little c. Oh yeah, you pick the little c, and then it has to follow by something. You pick the little c, but this little c is at the end of this string that this rule can generate. So why does why would that be in the first set? Because it yeah, wait, in the back there. Uh, the big c can be epsilon, which would give you epsilon little c. Right. So the fact that we know that c can go to epsilon, right? We know that epsilon is in the first set of c. Now when we see C here, we can say, hey, C goes to big C, little c. But we know this big C can go to epsilon, which means that this production rule can start with the little c, which means the first set of little c is going to be epsilon and c. And so now, using this information, now can we calculate the first set of s? Yeah, that is the first set of s. That's a, b, epsilon, c. So what's the first set of what's the first set of s, and how do I calculate it? That's the big thing. How do I actually calculate this? Subsets. The union of all these rules, A, first of A, first of B, first of C, mm -hmm. right? Because these are all specifically rules here, right? So I know S can be replaced by an A, which means that the first set of A has to be the same as the first set of S. I know S can produce B, so I can say it's got to be the first set of B <coughs> as well. And that S goes to C, so it has to be the first set of C as well. So it's going to be A, B, C, and epsilon.
So another thing to think about, right? When I'm parsing this, wouldn't it be A B C epsilon then A B epsilon then C? And where? A B epsilon C. Uh, order of sets doesn't matter. Um, totally forgot what I was going to say. It's clearly related to this, I hope. Maybe it's not important. Um, epsilon C's for sets. Uh, okay, yeah, so question is, is this grammar, so is this grammar ambiguous? And can we use first sets to calculate that? How would we be able to tell using this data? So what does it mean for something to be ambiguous? Confusing. What was it? Right, there's multiple parse trees for a single string. So how, or uh, another way to put that, right, is when we're parsing, right, can we tell by looking one character ahead, right, the predict, or I guess, sorry, uh, ambiguous is one thing. Uh, we're trying to focus here on predictive parsing. So, um, it can't be ambiguous to have a predictive parser, right? If it's ambiguous, then we have a big problem. Um, but for a predictive parser, we want to say, can, just by looking at one character, can we decide which of these rules to apply? So we're trying to parse S. Can we decide between big A, big B, or big C? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the B is kind of confusing, because it could be just this rule. S goes to big A, big B, big C. So why? So somebody tell me why using the information that we have here, why can we tell that? Yeah. Because uh, the firsts are all unique. You the firsts uh, of what? The, the outputs of each of the first sets of A, B, and C are all individually unique. Right. So just by looking at this first character, right, if I'm trying to parse an S and I look at the first character and I say, well, if it's an A, I know it's in the first of A, so I know this rule applies. If it's B, it must be first of B, so I know this rule applies. If it's a C, I know it's in here, so I know this rule applies. Uh, but what about B? Do we have a problem here? Yeah, I do. I think you do. You will always contain any or an amount of B. So you, you have more than one B, B, right? Can't you? Excuse me. So can we choose just by looking at one character which one of these rules to take? Oh, which one of those, the rules of Yeah, which one of these rules no. of B? We can't decide which rule of B, but we can decide that we can use the rule of B. Right, so, so actually, so yeah, from, from stays S. within B. Right, the way we have this written, right, both of the rules for B, B goes to big B, little b, B goes to little b, right, either of these two rules, these both, what's the first set of little b? B. And what's the first set of big B, little b? Little b, little b. Little b. The first set, just one character. One to oh, B. 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 Yeah, little B, right? So there's an intersection there. So actually, we can't write a predictive parser for this because we can't decide between which one of these two rules just by looking one character ahead, right? As we saw, if we look two ahead, then we can try and tell. Uh, but just looking one character ahead, we can't. What about this one, C? Can we tell which one to apply depending on this rule? Yes. It'll kill the epsilon so it goes back to little C. But if you see a C, you know it has to be the first rule. No, you still have to look to it. Uh, if it's a C, we know it has to be the first rule, right? Because the second rule here produces an epsilon, right? Um, although that's not 100%. Because it depends on what comes actually comes after the C. So we're actually going to look at, there's actually another function we have to define later. So this is just kind of peeking ahead. Uh, we're going to find another function called the follow which says what actually is the first character that comes after this. So then we can see, right? If we know that there's not, it's not possible for a small c to follow big C, then yeah, we can easily tell between these two rules, right? We can see either, either it's a c, which we know it's the first rule applies. Um, if the second rule applies, then it really depends on what comes after. Uh, but let's kind of leave that alone for now. And let's, what we're going to do now is we want to, what in the Are you guys getting that? No, it's just me. Oh, 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 I see. It's, okay. So now let's try to derive the rules for how we can actually calculate first sets. Right? They're not, they're not difficult. Um, they look very confusing if you just look at all five rules at once and you're just like, ah, this is a lot of math-looking things. Um, 
But if we develop them with these examples, I think this will be a lot more clear for you to understand the intuition behind the rules. And really, the intuition follows how to derive them. Uh, so let's consider. OK. Let's consider this. S goes to big A or big B. Uh, big A goes to little a. Big B goes to epsilon. Let's just look at A. I want to calculate the first of big A. It's just little a. Right, so how do I know what to do? <coughs> what was that? Yeah, I look at the first symbol that's on the right hand side. Right, so. Um, oh, on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah, the right hand side, right? This is the rule here. So then what is. I'm not really digging all this uppercase. Okay, so let's say, what's the first of little a? Little a. Uh, the set containing little a, right? Remember, we always got to consider sets. So is this type check? Isn't our type of the first set of the first function? Right, it returns a set. The set contains terminals and epsilons, and the input is a sequence of terminals, non-terminals, and epsilons. So what's, so can we generalize any rule from this? What, what kind of inference can we draw from this? The first of a terminal is a set containing that terminal. So why? <coughs> Convince me. It's, I mean, it's, it's a not, it's a terminal. It doesn't, it can't ever be anything but a terminal. Does everybody agree? Are we in agreement? Yes. Uh, because we're talking about, uh, we're defining, so first sets, yes. Yeah. So the input right into the first set are <coughs> non terminals, terminals, and epsilons. So basically, terminals and ep all those will be in the grammar, right? Um, so yeah, so if it's not one of those, then it's not. A terminal or non-terminal because it's just some other random symbol. So yeah, we don't need to worry about that. So then is this true? Is that true? I would like it to be so. You would like it to be so. So go back to the first set, right? What are the, what's the actual, what are the def, what's the definition of the first set, right? At a high level, what did we want it to do? To denote the set that which, you know, whatever rule you're applying the first function to, spits out the set of all the first characters that would determine it's that rule. Right, so another way to think about it is with parse trees, right? Mm -hmm. So all strings derived from that rule. So we think about a parse tree, right? We draw our parse tree. Right, so this is saying like starting at that node in our parse tree, applying all the rules we possibly can. What are, what's the first terminal that all strings deriving from that node in our parse tree can possibly start with? So how many children can this terminal have? None. None, right? It's a terminal by definition. Therefore, there's going to be no children here. So that way, all strings that start with the terminal x, any terminal x, are going to have a first set of just x. Right? Call this rule one. Right? Makes sense, right? It's an intuition. So what about, how do I, so we said this is, OK, it looks like this. But to get this, do we actually apply this rule? Yeah, we didn't actually apply this rule yet, right? We just used this rule to talk about this right-hand side. Uh, we'll kind of build that up in a second, but keep that in mind, right? This is one of the things we need to do is how do we actually propagate first sets? Or how do we uh, use these production rules to calculate first sets? Uh, but let's look at B. So we looked at A, right? And we actually were able to derive a rule from looking at A. So let's look at B. 
So I want to calculate the first set of B. So, you know, using intuition first, what's the first set of B? Epsilon? Oh, that's the not exist symbol. <laughs> Those are very really similar. I guess I should have learned Greek. Okay. So, to determine this, did we use this rule? Does rule one apply? <coughs> Question really is, is epsilon a terminal? Be whatever you want it to be. So I'm gonna face that. You can be wrong. It's totally fine. Yeah, no, it's, it's early. Not. It's the definition of a compact terminal, non-terminal terminal. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm more curious considering it says first x equals the set containing x. Yep. We're not actually putting the terminals in. We're putting the rules that apply the terminals. So does this still technically qualify as that? Say that again? So this is basically saying for any x, if x is a terminal, then the first of x is the second containing x. But we're not passing in the terminals. We're passing in the rules to call the terminals. Exactly. This, these are non-terminals. Yeah, we're going to get there. We're building up. We're going to build up our simple simple our simple cases first. He's, he's just kind I'm of just extrapolating from that. I'm just questioning, are we still technically applying this first rule? We haven't, no. Okay. Not, not to do calculate first of A or first of big B. Um, I, I missed what she said over there. Yeah, so what, uh, Sarah, right? Can you repeat what you were talking about, uh, the epsilon? Uh, so is it a terminal? No, because in, we define first uh, as first and alpha, where alpha is a sequence of grammar symbols, terminals, non-terminals, and epsilon. Ah, right, yeah, exactly. So our input to the first function is terminals, non-terminals, and epsilon, right? So we actually are, we didn't formally define it, but we are keeping this idea of terminals Right, are distinct from epsilon. Right, so this rule definitely doesn't apply because really we want to ask, right, what is the what's the first set of epsilon? Right, so how how can we think about this? So using the same like logic and reasoning that we use to think about rule one, how can we reason about this? Could it be what? Would it be the empty set? The empty set? It could be. That's a good guess. Could be anything. What is it? The empty set. <laughs> right, so in our parse tree, if we start at the node epsilon, So does this follow our? Uh, I think it does. Yeah. Does this follow the uh, intuition and the rules and the type checking that we stated for? Yeah, I think it does. Too. Right. So what's the return? What What is the first set output? For the first function. Sorry, I call them first sets, but. Is it the epsilon? Is what? Epsilon. Uh, it's a set containing what? Uh, an empty string. So epsilon is one of them, right? Epsilon and terminals, right? So first set returns epsilon and terminals, exactly. Um, so we actually we want to include this epsilon, right? The first set of epsilon. Um, we want it to be epsilon, right? And so rule one doesn't apply because epsilon isn't a terminal, but it is a leaf in our tree, right? So epsilon can't have any more children. It's not a non-terminal. Um, can we can we like update the the first of that rule say if x is a terminal or is the epsilon? Yes, we could, but we're not going to. <laughs> Adding another rule is the same thing. That's good. All right. So I've calculated first of A, first of B, using some of these rules. So how do I calculate S now? It's just A. 
Let's make it simpler, right? Let's remove just this rule, and we have this. It would just be A. Right, but, so it would be A, we know that from looking at it, but why? So what, what, what are we kind of intuitively doing to say that, well, in this case, the first set of S is going to be the set containing little a? It's a recursive call. It's a recursive call? So yeah, so to get the first of S, you look at, oh, it's not, it's a non-terminal. Okay, so the first of A, or big A then, and you just work your way down. Right, what if I added, I don't know, B, C, and D here? Does that change what we do? Are B, C, and D defined? Yeah, just define them. They're terminals. Small b, small d, so c, need small d. Yeah. In that case, you would do what you just said. But then, in addition to that, you would have to call the, like in your recursive call, if you want to do it recursively, you would pretty much apply the rule that we just defined, which is one. And if you would have an epsilon or you have d, you would take rule number two. And then for a, you pretty much apply one. Right, so kind of if we have it in this form, what of all of these, so if we think about the right-hand side of this first rule, right, how many symbols are on the right-hand side of this rule? Four. Four? Which one do we care about right now for calculating the first set? A. 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 Big, A. Big A. Why? It's the leftmost. It's the leftmost, but where is that, what is that intuition, where, why? Is it just because we said so? It's not completely defined. What was that? Wouldn't it also be because A is a non-terminal? Or we're looking is strictly, it? strictly at S and we wouldn't know if it's... What if I put, uh, let's say, the terminal E in front of here? Would I still look at big A? No, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore, why? Because it's not part of the first symbol. Right, it's not the leftmost symbol. <coughs> right, then I would look at E. So really what I care about, so on the right-hand side, well, So let's think about this from the tree perspective, too, because I think this helps. So we have S, right? And we have a potential rule that is S goes to A, little b, little c, little d, right? So when we're generating strings, every time we see an S, we're going to replace it. When we follow this rule, right, we're going to replace it with big A, little b, little c, little d, right? That's what the rule says. So doesn't this mean that anything that strings that it, all the strings possible strings that A generates, right? Their first set is the terminals that A can possibly start with. Doesn't that mean S also has to start with those because it's the leftmost symbol? Yeah, I guess. What was that? We're not talking about right to left. <laughs> Good try. See, the room agrees. <laughs> so we're only reading left to right, right? So all possible strings. So we think this A is going to generate and do whatever, right? But we can calculate the first of A, right? We've done that, actually. And so then we can say, OK, that means that all of those possible strings, A contains, the first of A contains the first characters of all of those strings. And since we replace S, we know that the first of S must also contain the first of A. And we know that because it's the leftmost symbol, right? If we had an E here, and our tree looked like this, then we don't really care necessarily yet what big A does. We say, what's the first of E, right? Because every string that S generates is going to have to start with the leftmost symbol on the right-hand side of the production rule. So how can we try and capture that in a rule? Does everybody agree with that? Let's see, can you repeat it? So S is going to generate a bunch of strings, right? And it's going to generate strings by applying each of these rules, right? Of S goes to whatever, each of these production rules. Here we only have one rule. It doesn't matter one or a hundred. But when we look at each rule, we say, OK, if this rule is chosen, this rule S goes to little e, big A, B, C, D, right? 
What I'm trying to find out is what are the starting terminals that strings that s generates starts with. And so I can generate s, and if I look at this rule, I say, well, it's got to be the same as the leftmost symbol of the right-hand side rule, right? But we said the first or the leftmost here, right? It's got to be the first of whatever that is. It's got to be the same. The first of s has to contain that if this rule is applied, right? And we're thinking about all possible applications of the rules. For phrasing of the rule, could it be that the first of s is equivalent to the first of the first of s? Because it'll just mm -hmm. be a recursive call until it gets to the terminal. Let's think about that. Yeah, that too. Okay, so let's say the first of. I need to peek for a second to make sure we. It'll be better if we use the right terms. Okay, yeah. So let's say we have the rule. Right, A goes to B alpha. So what did I kind of already use alpha as a little bit? What was that? Yeah, sequence of terminals, non-terminals, and epsilons, right? So alpha here that I'm using is not just doesn't represent one grammar symbol, it represents just a sequence of any number from zero to a hundred, right? Or whatever, it doesn't matter. Right, so then what is this big B here? Some non-terminal Some other definition. The leftmost symbol. So actually, that's a good point. Maybe we should change it from B to beta, right? Because it doesn't have to be the leftmost. Does the leftmost symbol have to be a non-terminal? No. No, right? Just like in here, the leftmost symbol is a terminal, right? So we'll call it beta. On the slides, it'll be B, but maybe I'll update them. Probably not. But um, the idea is here. So given this rule, then how do we calculate the first of A? It's beta. You look at the first of the uh, beta. First, first of beta. beta. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Break it down. Okay. Sorry, can you say that a little bit louder? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So the first of A, as of right now, is basically an empty set. And the first of beta would be whatever the first of beta is. So the right. first of A has to be the first of A plus the first of beta. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so actually we can leave it here, right? So we're just defining relations and rules. So we say, OK, how do we calculate the first of beta? Well, depending on what beta is, right, we have other rules to calculate that. Right, so now I can actually use this rule. I can actually use these three rules to say, if I have this case, right, S goes to Lily, big A, B, C, D, then which rule do I apply to calculate the first of S? Rule three. What was it? Rule three. Rule three. And then that says what? The first of S is what? E. It's the first of oh, Lily. The first, uh, which the the first of Lily, the first which then applies the first rule, which then returns the second containing Lily. Correct. Which then says, okay, now the first of S is the first uh, is the second containing E, right? And if I get rid of that, and it's the first of A, which is A, right? So the first of S is the first of A. Uh, the first of A is. So how do we calculate the first of A? The first. Rule one just says how to calculate the first of a terminal. So is big A a terminal? No. We can't use that, but what rule can we use? Three. Yeah. Right? Then we can say, okay, what's the leftmost symbol on this right hand side rule? A. Little a. So that's yeah. what rule two What's is. the first of little a? Which rule is that? The second thing. Rule one. Rule one. Yeah, we use rule one and we say, okay. So now we actually, using these three rules, right, we have a way to calculate the first sets of anything. Oh. Almost anything, yeah. We're actually not quite there. Um, mainly due to this little epsilon really messes things up. Not messes things up, it makes things trickier. Um, so on part, in project three, this is actually what you're going to be writing a program to do, is to automatically calculate first sets and follow sets. Um, so it's really important that you understand how to do this, how these rules work, and how to actually think about them algorithmically. 
Um, you know, we're just kind of getting into it now, but I want to tell you kind of part of why we're talking about it. Yeah. So what is actually rule three? Like, Say that again. Rule three. Mm -hmm. It's not oh, clear uh, what sorry. the rule is. It is this, basically. Oops. So that looks like it. Is there any way to simplify the way that is written? <laughs> there are many different ways to write it. Um, we're basically saying for any rule, for any rule of the form, a non-terminal goes to something on the right-hand side. We can take the leftmost symbol and say, uh, of the right-hand side, and say the first of the left hand side of the production rule is equal to the first of the first symbol on the right hand side of the rule. Or the leftmost left symbol of the right hand side of the rule. Oh. Right? This is what all this is saying. Right? It's like pattern matching, right, with math. So you're saying I mean, so you're saying like, okay, this can apply here to this rule big A goes to little a, right? Because this A matches this A. Alpha matches zero, nothing. We said it's a sequence, a sequence could be zero which means beta matches the terminal A, little a, and then now we have, um, and now we can just apply this rule, right? All we have to do is match it up to, the def to our definitions. All right, but is it enough? That's kind of the question. It's never enough. Because I already said it's not? Cool. Found out the hard way. All right. Yeah, let's change it a little bit. Okay, and we'll. This will hopefully try to um, show you, the problems. What yes. What would you call the rules of something? Uh, good question. <laughs> Calculating first the first set of rules, basically. First set. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go to A goes to big A little, big C little A. B goes to little b, and we'll say big C goes to little c or epsilon, right? So intuitively looking at it, what's the first of big B? Little b. Little b. Little b. And what's the first of big C? Little c or epsilon. Yeah, little c and epsilon, right? The second painting, little c and epsilon. I guess maybe I should take it back a little bit. Okay. So we can already look at this, and are we using our rules? Uh, so first of, of B, right? We said, so which, which rules do we apply to get to that? Rule three, then rule one, rule three, then rule one right? Yeah. Um, so then we say it's little b, and now we want to know the first set of C. Uh, so which rules are we applying? Rule three. Rule three with, let's say, this C goes to little c, and then which rule? And then rule one. Rule one to get the second painting C. But there's two, remember? The bar means there's two rules here. There's two rules of the form. C goes to something beta and then uh, alpha. And then we use rule two. To get and then Exactly. So we apply rule three again, and then rule two to say, okay, uh, that means this is also epsilon. So let's just straight apply our rules. So you're setting up a hierarchy. Hierarchy? It'll apply C first and then epsilon. Uh, it doesn't really matter the order. That's kind of the nice things about these rules, right? They all apply all the time. So, so the uh, first of C could be epsilon. First of C could be little c or epsilon, yeah. That's why it doesn't matter. So it the order doesn't matter. It could be epsilon c. Exactly. Okay, so just applying our rules then, how do we calculate the first of big A? It's the first of C. Right, so we apply three, which is the first of of big C, right? So what's the first of big C? C or epsilon. C or epsilon. Is that correct, though? No, no. because if it's epsilon, the first string could actually be. So let's talk about, based on this rules, right? We actually don't care about S at all, but just on these rules, right? 
what are all strings that A could possibly generate? So if we drew a tree, right? I mean, what are the strings? Like, actually, right now we can list them, right? Because these aren't infinitely long strings. So what's the set of all strings that A could possibly generate? C, A, little C, little A, or just little A. So what's the first set of this? What are the first characters here? C, C, A, or A. Is that the same thing as what we just calculated above? No. Yeah. Do we have a problem? Yes. Yes, we have a massive problem, right? <laughs> the whole point of calculating the first sets is that we want to get this, right? We want to know for all possible strings that A could generate, what's the first character that's in there? So if, if you have in your first set an epsilon, then you also need to calculate what to the next one to replace that epsilon when it, when it does show up. Right? Yeah, so the first problem would be, right, so I, I did kind of already say, right, but the epsilon is basically what spoils it in first of C. Right? So the first thing to think about is, okay, for rule three, actually this rule isn't quite complete. Yeah? Uh, the rule three would be complete, you don't have to do the union without the alpha. And then if you do the union, you have to be, uh, sorry, so for here, um, beta doesn't necessarily have to have an epsilon in it or not. Right, no, I understand. For, right. for, that, for that specific one, but then okay. for, for this one, because you know alpha can be like a sequence of characters. Right. In that case. Let's add another rule for that. We're going to add a rule. So that's one problem, right? Yeah, we need to pick up, at some point we need to somehow pick up this A, right? But that's not the only problem with this set. What's the other problem with it? Yeah, it has an epsilon in it. So there's actually two problems with this set, right? And so we're actually going to, we need to add a rule and we need to actually change rule three. So where did that epsilon come from? Why did we add epsilon? Because it was part of rule C. Because it was part of the first of C, right? And we were applying this rule directly. But does it really mean if A goes to beta whatever and something after it? Remember, here I'm not looking at anything after it. I don't want to look into anything after it. If there's an epsilon in beta, does that mean A can also produce an epsilon? Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily, and not in every case, right? Because just like in this case, if you have an, a terminal after it, well then clearly A is never going to generate the empty string, right? So A, the first of A is never going to contain epsilon. But just because C started here, this means I copied it over. Right? So maybe shouldn't we like take out epsilon here? Well, taking out epsilon wouldn't give us A. Exactly. One problem at a time. Right? Perfect. So take out epsilon and then also add in. Right. So <laughs> then now we need another rule. Right? So yeah. No, no, please. I don't, I don't want to complicate things, but Potentially, let's say alpha was something like big, let's say something like big C, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, if alpha could have an epsilon in it, would it be correct to get out the epsilon? Because potentially you can get the empty string. Yeah, that's yeah. the last rule. We have two more rules to go. One of which uh, is going to pick the A. So the second one, yeah, the problem you said is, right, is well, hey, we just took out epsilon here. But what if beta and every character in alpha, right, all of them produce epsilon, then one possible string, right, is going to produce the empty string, epsilon. Exactly, so I should put the first set in there. Uh, yeah, let's look at that. Keep that in mind, that's a good point. But we need another rule, right? So how do I know when to look at the next rule? Or how do I know, so basically, okay, I apply this rule, right? But how do I know to look at, let's say, the first character of, or the first symbol of alpha? When can I do that? If the first of B contains epsilon. If the first of, of beta, right? Yeah, if the first of beta contains epsilon. Yeah. Right, exactly. I can look at the first character there. Um, what if both those first two contain epsilon? Which first two? Just goes to beta and, and alpha? 
what if uh, beta and then the first of alpha both contain epsilon? Like, what if I did this? Does this change anything? Uh, big C, big C, A. Ah, ah. I thought I got better at that. Okay. I'm not keeping buttons. Right? So this matches rule three with beta, right? This C, A, big C, little a is alpha. So I say, okay, if there's an epsilon in the first one in beta, then I add the first set of the second well, one of A. Then you'll still call rule three to get the first of that. Right. And then you'll hit, you'll hit that again, so it'll go to the first well, I don't quite a. have a rule to handle that yet, but yeah. So the idea is we need to keep moving on, right? No matter how many C's, and they don't have to be the same thing. It could be D, right? As long as D, let's say it could go to epsilon, right? Every time there's a possible epsilon here, I need to keep adding. But I stop, right? If one of these, like, uh, if there's a B at the end here, right, do I ever look at the first set of big B here? Because you have an terminal Right, because one of these has a first set that does not contain epsilon, right? One of these symbols in that grammar. So we're going to write the rule. Uh, I'm going to write it a little mathy because it's very concise and nice. Okay, so basically if we have a rule of the form, A goes to uh, beta zero, uh, beta one, all the way up to beta, uh, I gotta cheat, oh, it's way too small, nobody can read that, I mean. Okay, what do I use, I, yeah, beta I. Right, and we have beta, I plus one, and then let's say we have alpha afterwards. Then I want to say if there is, right, I'm checking if epsilon exists in the first of beta zero uh, and, right, and <coughs> epsilon exists in the first of beta one, right, all the way up to if epsilon exists in the first of beta i. So if this is the case, right, if there's an epsilon in the first sets of all of these first symbols, then which one do I add from this, a rules of this form, which one do I add to the first set of a? The first of beta, beta zero i plus, I plus one. one. I plus one, right? Why don't I worry about beta zero? Yeah, because rule three handles that, right? Rule three will add that, right? So then I want to say the first of A, then first of, what was it again? I plus one. I plus one. Is this, is this right? Am I done? What does alpha mean? Whatever is out, just anything that comes out after beta i plus Exactly. So what do we have to do here? Why do we have to do this? To make the exception for rule four. Right. Well, for one case, right? But this is just one. So do we, if there's a first in beta of i plus one, can we necessarily add epsilon to the first of a? If there's an epsilon in the first of beta i plus one, right, should we add it to the first of a, even though there can be other symbols here? Well, when you call when you call the beta of i plus one, you then you know instantiate another call for this rule, which then covers all that. It's recursive. Right, but if beta i right to get here, let's say there is no epsilon here, okay. right, at i plus one. This is a recursive rule, right? So it also applies to beta zero, beta one, beta i, right? At beta one, if that had an epsilon in it, and it must if we got to beta i plus one because of this definition, right? Yeah. Um, should I have added the epsilon to first of a? No. Say it louder, please. We want 
a single epsilon, but the idea is, okay, if I get, when I get here, right, so this is beta i, right, do all the betas from one, all the symbols here have an epsilon in their first set? Yes. Yeah? C, 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 right? Um, then I can add beta i plus one here, but if I also apply that logic here, right, if this is beta i, so I need to add the next one, i plus 1. Right. Do I add the epsilon from the first of c to the first of a? No. No, right? Because I haven't gone all the way through. I only want to add the epsilon if I go all the way through the string. So we're going to want to actually, just like we did before, right, take out epsilons here. Which then leads us to the fifth rule. So we can go through this quickly. When, just intuitively, right, when do I want to add an epsilon to the first of a? Yeah, put it another way, when there's nothing there. It's a little existential. Uh, <coughs> when the string is one beta i plus one has. When all of them, yeah, the entire, every single symbol on the right hand side, if there's first in all of them, then I'm going to add epsilon. So, kind of just very quickly, the way we've been writing it, we'd say something like this beta zero all the way up to uh, beta, we'll call it k for the n. Right, so there's nothing after. There's no alpha that catches everything after. Or, and we'd say, you know, if epsilon exists in all of these in the first uh, beta zero, um, and all the way up to epsilon exists in the first of beta k, then we add. That's when we can add the epsilon in here. So we'll go over these rules, right? We'll go over them much uh, more formally, and we'll see an application of them. But they'll, they, they look scary and complicated, right? But if the, the trick is just remembering the intuition behind these rules, right? And the fact that, yes, uh, you, know, you derive these just from looking at examples, right? They're not. They're not crazy complicated. They're not, you know, way far out there. They just kind of follow from what we're trying to do here to try to calculate this. Should that say first of k equals first of a? No, it's the first of a is the set containing epsilon. Uh, there's also a thing. First of a. B sub k right there equals? No. This is a if statement. I just tried to write this on one line. Basically, oh, that's if, the other. That's yeah, the other. this is the body of the if condition. Then, cool. All right, great. Thanks. Sorry we went over, but I really wanted to get to this fifth rule since we're almost there. We'll go over it again, don't worry.